Please turn in your Bibles this evening to the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, and verse 31. Hebrews, chapter 10, and verse 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. At first sight, this might look like it's going to be an exceedingly solemn message. And in one sense, of course, there is that solemn, that sobering element to consider such a verse as this. But it's so vital that we think about these things and their application to us as individuals. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And the writer to the Hebrews in this chapter is seeking to show under inspiration of the Spirit of God that the new covenant centred in the Lord Jesus Christ is superior to that of the old. And he uses a number of arguments for his case. He shows that in the old covenant there were many sacrifices, multitudes of sacrifices were made. Animals were slain and consumed on the altar. And through those sacrifices, no sin was ever forgiven. They were a picture. They were an illustration. They pointed forward to the one true sacrifice that would come, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And by contrast... An old covenant that had multitudes of sacrifices that accomplished nothing, there is the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. His death upon the cross at Calvary and the great power of that sacrifice to change and transform lives and bring men and women into a relationship with their God. He goes on to say, that the Lord Jesus Christ, we read it in the reading, these words, has opened up a new and living means of access unto God. He says that the old covenant, with all the picture language, all the ceremonies, all the rituals through which they had to go, was a prefigurement, a, a picture, a visual aid, pointing forward to what Christ would do and the new covenant And Christ's work is the fulfilment of all of those things. That the Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled the law in every particular. And so his reasoning goes on to say that the Hebrew Christians must hold to the truth of the exclusive claim of the New Testament covenant in the Lord Jesus Christ and to live their lives in the light of these things. And we come down to verse 26. For if we willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, so if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. There is no other way of salvation. The Lord Jesus Christ is the exclusive, the only means by which a a man, a woman, a young person can be forgiven and brought to Almighty God. The consequences of denying that is there is no other sacrifice. But verse 27 says, by contrast, all that remains is a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. Outside of Christ, to deny the effectiveness of Christ, to refuse to his invitation to come, is to set ourselves only on the pathway to judgment. He uses a little more reasoning. We must come to our verse quite quickly, but a little more reasoning. He says that under the Old Testament, covenant if you despised the law then there was the death penalty and that was applied without mercy 
if it was established that these things were true. And verse 29, in the light of that, of how much sorer punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, ignored what Jesus Christ had done, counted it as nothing, refused his invitation. The punishment due to us is very great. Verse 30 speaks of the character of God. We'll speak a little of this in a moment. We know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. The very character of our God demands that sin be punished. And then comes our verse. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Well, just three things I want us to consider regarding this text. And the first is this. Why is it a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God? And in one sense, we've uh, met one of the great reasons for that already. Because of God's revealed character. God, yes, is a God of love, a God of mercy, a God of great grace, but he is a God of holiness, a God of righteousness, a God of unbending justice, and is determined to punish all sin. Verse 30 says, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense. That's not the, the statement of someone who is just full of uh, revenge. This is the statement of a, a holy being with settled indignation against the horror of sin and its offence against his character. I'm going to read to you a verse from the book of Deuteronomy. If you're writing down texts, it's Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 10. I'm going to read verse 9 too because every time the Bible speaks of judgment and of wrath to come, it's always within the context of available mercy, available grace, available forgiveness, available eternal life. Verse 9 of Deuteronomy chapter 7. Know therefore that the Lord thy God he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. <coughs> mercy, available grace, is set before us first. But then verse 10, And repayeth them that hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hateth him, he will repay him to his face. And we could look at countless scriptures. That's not our purpose this evening. But we could look at many scriptures that speak of the character of our God. His hatred of sin, his determination to judge sin. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. His character demands that my sin be dealt with. But then we might consider for a moment or two the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry recorded in the Gospels. And you know, it's, it's odd, but when you speak to the generality of people around, the view they have of the Lord Jesus Christ is something like this. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. And of course that's true. There is that side of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he above all, he far beyond any other contributor to the New Testament, spoke openly and very plainly about judgment and about the consequences of rejecting the living God. He spoke on a number of occasions about outer darkness the complete absence of light, that disturbing, that unsettling 
withdrawal of all light and spiritual understanding and insight snatched away. In another place, he speaks of a furnace of fire and of a fire that burns forever. In yet another place, he speaks of a worm that dieth not. And we, these are graphic pictures to help us to understand something of the horror of being away from our God and the consequences of our sin. The testimony of the Saviour is so very clear. Unrepentant, never having bowed the knee to my God, refused his gracious invitations, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But then when you think of Calvary, oh, what an insight we get into what it means to fall into the hands of the living God because our Saviour willingly, on behalf of his people, fell into the hands of the living God. We see displayed before us all the horrors of what it meant and what it could mean to fall into the hands of the living God. And we know that he was impaled upon that cross. And we know that he had been beaten. He had been punched. But those things, those physical sufferings, even the physical anguish as he hung there suffocating upon the cross, those things were but a pale reflection of the hidden spiritual reality and what was actually taking place. When God the Father put upon him, upon his pure and holy soul, the incredible weight of sin and of guilt, and then smote him, punished him in our place, if we're among those who have come to know him. And when we th think of uh, him there hanging upon the cross, we get just a little glimpse in those words that he uttered, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? There as he hung on the cross, he took what it meant to fall into the hands of the living God for all those that would be saved. And we see that so clearly. If we never repent of our sin, if we never come to Jesus Christ for forgiveness, these are the pangs that we must bear ourselves without end for all eternity, separated from God in that place of banishment that the scripture calls hell. We ourselves, we have an understanding that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We've, every one of us, been given an instinct for life and for the preservation of life. Uh, we know that death is something tremendous. It isn't just the cessation of our existence. And this instinct, it's in everyone, whether a believer in God or an atheist. We do everything we can to keep body and soul together, to maintain life, because it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We've also been given an instinct for justice. And you know how it is that from time to time, and even at the present time, there are cases in the media of high-profile people who have lived their lives successfully and died happily. And yet it turns out that they've lived their lives and they've committed terrible crimes, wickedness, awful things come to the surface. And yet they escaped justice. They escaped any form of a comeback for those things here in this life. And as far as we can tell, they died completely happily with all their wealth, all their possessions around them. But you know, as you speak to people, they say, well, surely there must be a day of reckoning for them. And we almost hope, we almost pray that those people, uh, those high profile people who have lived in this way, 
will in some way be brought to book, will suffer the consequences and suffer justice due for their sin and for their wickedness. You know, it's so easy, isn't it, to project that onto others and to see it in others and to fail to see what sin has done to me, what sin has led to for me. And therefore I should feel that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But let's look secondly in this text at uh, some aspects of our attitudes towards God and towards his salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. We get some help. It's quite searching, actually, when you begin to think of the text in this way. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It may be that you're sitting here hearing this message and actually... In all honesty, you have very little concern for your sin. You're not troubled by the sort of person that you are. You've, you've developed that skill. When conscience rears its head, you've successfully battered it down. And now it very rarely speaks with any great volume. You're quite content with your sins. And if they do ever trouble you, you've developed the skill of explaining them away. You turn a sin into a virtue. You use a different term for a sin to make it not sound so bad so that your conscience isn't troubled. And you've got to that point where you're almost without any concern about your sin whatsoever. Oh, that word for should come to haunt you. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. As it were, to walk through life blindfold to the reality of what sin is doing to your conscience, what sin is doing to your soul, the incredible weight of guilt that you're building up and with no consciousness to arrive at the moment of death only to fall into the hands of the living God to be overwhelmed with a sense of the reality of sin. That thing that I explained away, that thing that I ignored, that thing that I counted as nothing at all. I'm overwhelmed with a sense of sin as I'm called to stand before my God. The word for also suggests to us surprise in terms of timing. It may be that some of you here, you've heard the message of the gospel, perhaps a number of times, perhaps many times. And you have a measure of concern about your sin and about your need. But for the present time, your attitude is this. That's for later. <coughs> I'm going to put it off for the time being. I'm going to wait. If I'm young, it may be that I say, I'll wait until I'm an adult. I'm a child now. When I'm an adult, I'll consider these things, forgetting that when you're an adult, there are so many pressures, so many uh, calls upon your time, so many things that you have to do that those things, those thoughts will be swamped out. It may be that you're a little older and you say, but I've got ambitions. I've got things that I want to accomplish. Perhaps when I'm settled, perhaps when I'm in middle age, I'll consider these things. I'll put it off. But when you get to middle age, that cynicism begins to creep in. Yes, I had those concerns when I was young. I'm over that now. My life is busy. There are many calls on my time and uh, my attention, and yet I've got those outlets that I, of things that I enjoy, if I'm ever to think about it, I'll do it in old age. And even in old age, there are issues. It's so difficult, having lived an entire life away from God, to look back and to say, these 60, these 70 years, I was wrong. I was a fool. I lived 
for the here and now, and I can sit. No, people just don't do that ordinarily. And we become entrenched. We become settled. We become embittered. And it's so hard to shift us. But really, the point I'm trying to drive at and get to is this. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Who knows how long any one of us has? Who knows that this might be the last Lord's Day when the call of the gospel is set before you, the pleadings of the Saviour are brought to your attention. Sin is laid bare and shown in its ugliness and the promise of salvation is set before you. By next Lord's Day, someone here, who knows, I sincerely hope not, but someone here may be called into eternity and all those good intentions, all those thoughts that one day, one day, one day I'll turn and consider my sin. It's too late. It's too late because I've fallen over the brink, the threshold of eternity, and I've fallen into the hands of the living God, an unrepentant sinner, only to face his justice. Still others might think something along these lines. Surely God doesn't take sin that seriously. Uh, th the way you're speaking about sin, you make it sound as though the smallest white lie is a crime against almighty God and will shut me out of heaven's glory. Surely God doesn't take sin that seriously? But the verse helps us. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The God with whom we have to do is alive. He is a conscious being. He looks down upon mankind. He is the living God. He knows. He sees all things. He marks each and every sin. His standard, his law is unbending. And the smallest breach, we're told in scripture, is effectively to smash the entirety of God's holy law. And of course, to think, if I were to commit just one sin, is so foolish. Because every sin is a multitude of sins. One sin leads to another, perhaps to cover up a lie, a deception, and so on. We, have, we commit mountains of sins. And God sees them all. And he must punish sin. Lastly, as we consider these attitudes towards our God, perhaps you think in common with very many people in society today that death is the end. That when I die, my body is committed to the grave. That's it. That's the end. But you know, our verse says this. What a shock it's going to be to go through life Imagining that there's nothing after life and the light of this world goes out and the light of the next suddenly comes on. What a shock. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Overwhelmed with a sense of the majesty and the being of God. Instantaneously that awareness of who he is having ignored him all my life long. No wonder it says it is a fearful thing. The shock of that, overwhelmed with a sense of my sinfulness. I never thought about it before, but now I see it. I, all I can do is acknowledge it. And in that position before my God, there will be tremendous remorse, but no place for repentance. No opportunity of salvation. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. 
I'll see the happiness of all those who came to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as they enter into his immediate presence and they see their saviour face to face. These are people perhaps who I regarded in life as somewhat ridiculous, a bit simple, a bit soft-headed, needing a crutch to help them through life. Perhaps I laugh at them, perhaps I deride them, perhaps I do worse. But suddenly, as I'm swept into eternity to see the blessedness of those who have trusted the Saviour and all that I've lost, it overwhelms me. And then I'm consigned to everlasting banishment, to a place where there is no good, the justice and righteous indignation of the God who would have saved me who would have blessed me. Now is my lot for all eternity in hell. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But thirdly, I hope I haven't been too negative or too stern. I hope I haven't in any sense sought to frighten. But thirdly and very encouragingly, there is a way of falling into the hands of the living God that leads to life, that leads to blessing, that leads to forgiveness. Think again of the Lord Jesus Christ there upon the cross. I wonder if you've ever noticed this. As he hung there, he said many things. I'm not going to rehearse them all before you this evening. He said... My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He felt that dereliction, that abandonment that is the lot of those who fall into the hands of the living God as God punished him in the place of those who would be saved. A little later, and shortly before he bowed his head in death, he cried, It is finished. That was not just a comment regarding the end of his physical sufferings. This was a, a triumphant cry that his sacrifice on behalf of sinners had been successful, that the debt had been paid in full. This was a shout of triumph. It is finished. But he had one other cry just as he bowed his head in death. We find it recorded in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23 and verse 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. And here we see the Lord Jesus Christ as it were, leading the way and showing us what we must do if we are to be saved. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But while we are in life, before we die, we must commit our soul into the hands of the living God. You may know, that in uttering those words, the Lord Jesus Christ was quoting from a psalm. Psalm 31 and verse 5. Into thine hand I commit my spirit. The Saviour took those, ter those words and used them in his own situation. But if you have a chance to look at Psalm 31, read the entire verse. Into thine hand I I commit my spirit, thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. Read the whole psalm. Oh, the blessings, the wonderful blessings that are the lot of those who commit their soul into the hands of the living God, seeking salvation, seeking pardon, seeking new life. The blessings are so wonderful. 
And that's what we must do. We must commit our souls in this life into the hands of our God. What does it mean to do that? Well, it means, first of all, to recognise that what God says about me is true. I'm a sinner. I'm away from him. I deserve eternal punishment. It would be just if God immediately were to consign me and banish me to the punishment of eternity away from him. I acknowledge that to be true. I commit my, my soul into the hands of my God as I confess my sins to him. I begin to open up my heart and show to him and rehearse before him the sort of person that I've been. All those words that I've spoken, those deeds that I've done, those thoughts that I've had, those wrong motives, the many things that I ought to have done and have neglected. I confess my sins to him. That's to commit your soul into the hands of the living God for salvation. It means that we look to what the Lord Jesus Christ did upon the cross. We see in him the only hope that we have for our soul. There's nothing that I can do. The, my situation is too grave. I'm too far gone. I can contribute nothing. There's nothing I can do to be saved except to look to that sacrifice made by the Lord Jesus Christ. I depend entirely upon him. And the glorious thing is this. Just as his arms were pinned wide to the cross, his arms are held out and held out widely in invitation to sinners to come to him for pardon and for forgiveness, even tonight. Fall into his arms. Commit your soul to him. He will receive you. He will forgive you. He will bless you. The alternative is unthinkable. To go on rejecting him. To live my life as though those promises meant nothing. As though all that the word of God says about me is false. To make God a liar. Because if I die unrepentant, condemned at the end of life's journey, or when our Saviour shall return, I shall fall into his hands for judgment. When mercy was available, when grace was so freely available, when the invitation had been set before you, fall into the hands of your Saviour for salvation. Let's pray together. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, give us, we pray, that due sense of seriousness as we consider our own state and condition before Thee. If we've never considered these things, if we've never really thought what it would mean to stand before Thee in judgment, then, O oh Lord, Fix these things in our minds and make them inescapable and show us in the arms of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one to who, into whose arms we must commit our soul for salvation and for every blessing. We ask these things in his name and for his sake. Amen. Our closing hymn this evening is the hymn number 362. And if I can draw your...